Chapter 10. Putting an end to the young girl. The young girl is a reality as massive and crumbly as the spectacle. Like all transitory forms, the young girl is an oxymoron. She is thus the first case of asceticism without ideal, a materialist penance. Cowardly devoted to the whims of the young girl, we have learned to disdain her while obeying her. The sexual misery of today in no way resembles that of the past, because it is now bodies without desires that burn for not being able to satisfy them. In the course of its metastasized development, seduction has lost its intensity what it has gained by extension. Never has a Morris discourse been so poor as when everyone makes it their duty to intone it and comment upon it. The young girl does not have the face of a dead girl, as one might think from reading avant-garde women's magazines, but of death itself. Everyone seeks to sell him or herself, but nobody manages to do so convincingly. Contrary to what might seem to be happening, at first glance, the rapist does not struggle with a particular woman or man, but with sexuality itself, as an authority of control. Upon its emergence, the naked body of the young girl succeeded in producing a sense of truth. Since then, we have vainly sought such a power in ever younger bodies. The charms we no longer find in the young girl are the exact measure of what we have already managed to liquidate in her. The question is not of the emancipation of the young girl, but of emancipation in relation to the young girl. In certain extreme cases, one sees the young girl turning the void within her against the world that made her what she is. The pure void of her form, her profound hostility to everything that is, will condense into explosive blocks of negativity. She will have to ravage everything that surrounds her. The barren expanse that substitutes for interiority will long to reduce some stretch of empire to equivalent desolation. Give me a bong. I have to die, exalted a Russian nihilist in the last century, begging to be given this suicide attack on Grand Duke Sergei. For the young girl, as for a man in power, who in every way resemble each other when they don't simply coincide, desubjectivation, not avoid a collapse, a collapse in oneself. Differences in the height of the fall simply measure the gulf between the fullness of social being and the extreme anemia of singular being. In other words, finally, the poverty of the relation to the self. And yet there is, in the one's destitution, the power that lacks in the completeness of the other. But I had to remove the order in which man looks to unwreath this other female figure, the apparently immaterial young girl deprived of sensuality, by showing that she is precisely the same kind of mother, and that virginity is, by definition, as foreign to her as a courtesan. Indeed, the study also shows that maternal love itself has no moral value attached to it. Otto Weininger, Sex and Character. Rarely has an epoch been so violently shaken by desires, and rarely has desire been so empty. The young girl makes one think of the monumentality of platonic architecture, looming over the present. It gives only a fleeting idea of eternity, for it is already cracking. Occasionally, the young girl also makes one think of something else. A hovel, invariably. I could destroy the schoolgirl's modernity by introducing into it foreign and heterogeneous elements scrambling everything up for all it was worth. We told Gumbrowitz, Ferdi Duke. Beneath the apparent disorder of the desires of the Cassern Babylon, the order of self-interest reigns supreme. But the order of self-interest itself is only a secondary reality, whose justification does not lie in itself, but in the desire for desire found at the foundation of every failed life. Changes in the young girl systematically follow the evolution of capitalist modes of production. Thus, over the past thirty years, we have passed, little by little, from to seduction, with its designated sites and man moments, its static and proto-bourgeois couple form, to post fortis seduction, diffuse, flexible, precarious, and deritualized, which has extended the couple factory to the entire body and the whole of social time space. At this particularly advanced stage of total mobilization, each of us is called on to maintain our seduction power, the substitute for labor power, such that on the sexual marketplace, we can be fired and rehired at any moment. The young girl mortifies her flesh in order to take revenge on biopower, the symbolic violence to which the spectacle subjects it. The distress she exhibits overwhelmingly reveals in its former aspect of unshakable positivity, sexual pleasure as the most metaphysical of physical pleasures. Some make sophisticated, hip, trendy magazines. We've made a healthy magazine, fresh, eerie, filled with blue skies and organic fields, a magazine more authentic than nature itself. The young girl is entirely constructed. This is why she can also be entirely destroyed. It is only in her suffering that the young girl is lovable. There is evidently a subversive power in trauma. The success of the mimetic logic that has carried the young girl to her present triumph also contains the necessity of her extinction. It is finally the inflation of young girls that will have most surely undermined the efficacy of each of them. The theory of the young girl participates in the training of a gaze that knows how to hate the spectacle wherever it hides. That is, wherever it shows itself. Who aside from a few half-wit stragglers can still be seriously moved in the face of the ruse, the device by which he knows how to insinuate himself into the heart of the young girl, the influence uh, he knows how to hold over them. 
Finally, the fascinating calculated and methodical character of seduction. Soren Kierkegaard? Wherever the commodity is unloved, so is the young girl. The spread of the seduction relation into all social activities signals the death of whatever was still living within it. The spread of simulation is also what renders seduction more and more obviously impossible. Now is the time of the greatest unhappiness. The streets filled with heartless sensualists, seducers mourning for seduction. The corpses of desires nobody knows what to do with. It would be a physical phenomenon, like a loss of aura, as though the electrification of bodies, an intense separation it had caused, began to spread to the point of disappearance. Out of this, a new proximity would emerge, and new distances. A total exhaustion of desire would mean the end of the market society, and, for that matter, of all society. Landscape of a ravaged Eros As a general thesis, social progress and changes in time periods occur because of the progress of woman toward liberty. Francois Marie Charles Foyer When the young girl has exhausted all artifice, there is only one artifice left for her. The renunciation of artifice. But this last one really is the final one. In making itself the Trojan horse of worldwide domination, desire has emptied itself of everything that smacked of domesticity, coziness, privacy. The precondition of totalitarian reconfiguration of what is desirable has been its autonomy from every real object and all particular content. And learning to train itself on essences, desire has become, despite itself, an absolute desire. A desire for the absolute that nothing earthly can quench. This unquenchability is the central lever of consumption, and of its subversion. A communization of bodies is to be accepted. Does the everyday occurrence of the young girl still go without saying?